So water and sediment sampling is, have a variety of important applications. The ones that we'll take a look at are um, related to surface water and groundwater sampling. And in particular, we'll look at uh, suspended and bed load samples where we're looking at uh, the sediment moving along with the flow in a stream as well as the sample of the, the bed material. Uh, from groundwater, um, there are a variety of other issues related to groundwater sampling. The wellbore uh, affects the uh, concentrations of the groundwater and that ends up causing a variety of problems. And so groundwater sampling methods have been developed to uh, try to mitigate these problems. The, you can use regular uh, three wellbore volume purging, low flow purge packers or diffusion samplers to try to mitigate these problems and we'll discuss those in the, the following uh, talk. And so this just gives you a, an overview of sediment transport by uh, with a bed load and a suspended load um, as one of the challenges for sampling. So suspended, suspended sediment is material that is uh, solid material that's suspended up in the water flow. And the challenge here is to obtain samples of the water and characterize the concentration of the sediment in the water. And the concentrations that we're going to be interested in is to express the mass of sediment per volume of water. And then we'll be able to calculate the overall mass rate if we know the average suspended sediment concentration and the average volumetric flow rate. So there are a couple of different methods for doing this, but the, the, the best one is to use a, what's called an isokinetic uh, method. And this takes advantage of the, basically a, a process of integrating the concentrations over the depth. And the reason for doing that is shown here in this uh, photograph. Here we've got two rivers um, converging, and the confluence uh, shows that <coughs> the suspended sediment in one river is much different than in the other. And so we see some segregation across the, the width of the river. And so pretty clearly we need multiple samples to be taken uh, in order to get the average concentration over this river. And we might imagine also if we could take a look at the concentration over the depth that the concentration of the suspended sediments would vary with the depth. And I think a simple reason for that would be that the Suspended sediment really represents a range of grain sizes, and the coarser material would be further down uh, at greater depth, and it would get finer upwards generally. And so we need to be able to sample, and, and we're either going to sample at many different depths and many positions, or what, what's done is to use a technique for uh, obtaining a sample that integrates over the uh, region of the um, of the stream, and here's a technique or a, a sampler that's designed for doing that. This is a depth integrated sampler, and here is a, a photograph of of this thing. Basically, it's a sample bottle right here, and there's a nozzle that has a tube that goes into the sample bottle. And there's a vent right here, so as the water flows in, the uh, air that's trapped in there flows back out. And by doing that, you, can, you have a, a device that will fill with the water um, slowly. Basically, the, the velocity or the pressure of the water is causing the water to, to flow in. So the pressure is from the depth, and there's also some velocity from the flow that, that pushes the water into this nozzle. But the flow in through the nozzle is fairly slow compared to the, the volume of the bottle. So what you can do is put this thing down in the stream, like what this guy is doing, and then raise it up gradually. And if you raise it up at a rate that is scaled to the flow rate, then you can 
well, if you know what the flow rate is, then you can calculate what the filling rate of this thing is, this, uh, this bottle, and you, you time the rate at which you lift this up through the flow so that it uh, is accumulating water uh, at, at a steady rate and when you're, when you're done with the, the, the traverse, usually you go up and down, and when you're done with the traverse, you've uh, filled the bottle up. And so you have one sample where the sample has been obtained over the full depth range in the stream. Okay, Then you analyze that and you get what the concentration of the sediment is at that position in the stream. So this is a handheld device and then there are similar arrangements where a, a you can see this has a little nozzle on it and this is uh, kind of a torpedo shaped uh, thing that is dropped into flowing water. This is set up to be lowered in, in this, lowered off this bridge with a crane um, for getting sediments in, uh, in, in water that's deep. I mean, you can see that this is, this is already a pretty hairy situation with this guy out in this fast flowing water. If it was much deeper, if it was a little bit deeper than this, it just would not be possible. So you, you have the ability to lower it off of a, off a bridge. And so the way you would do this is to measure the velocity in the stream, and that's, uh, th that's shown on this table here, and then uh, determine the rate at which the, this is, this is, these are basically the filling rates, and there's a procedure then for, uh, for determining how rapidly you would traverse the sampler through the stream to get a representative sample. And then the, the strategy would be to make uh, a sample here and it, you've divided up the stream into equal areas and so you make a sample here and, and get the material and you know the velocity there and you do it at all these different places so you know the concentration and the velocity uh, over these different widths of, of stream and by, by knowing that you can then uh, sum them up and get the total, the, you get a, a total average concentration and you could then get a, a total mass flowing per unit of time in the stream. And that's, that's really the main thing that you're going to want to come up with is the, the mass rate, well the sediment concentration and the mass rate. Okay, so that's called the isokinetic sampling method where you're, you're doing a depth averaging by obtaining samples slowly uh, over a, a time period as you're traversing the, the flow. Another way to get samples for surface water is to use a non-isokinetic method where you get a sample at a, at a particular point. And there are a couple of ways of doing that. A simple method, the dip method, um, you would just go out and and fill up a container and could be just from the surface. It's also possible to just take a container, put it below the surface and open it under the underwater. And usually you would do this where you're having, you're pointing the container upstream with you downstream. Um, so that's, that's possible. There are also devices that are developed to enable that and several of them are shown here and basically the way these things work is that you lower it down to a certain depth and then uh, it's open when you lower it in and it has uh, plugs that uh, can be remotely actuated and it'll plug up the sampler and allow you to um, uh, basically contain the sample within there within the sampler you pull it out and you have a sample at the depth where this is actuated. Um, there are a couple of different designs. Uh, this is a Kemmerer sampler and it's uh, set up pretty much like this uh, sketch and the way that this is actuated is by uh, you're suspending the sampler from a wire and then this piece here at the top uh, is a weight that you drop down and that actuates it and closes it and, and you get a sample. Here's a, a different version of this. Um, these are usually deployed, these can deploy vertically or horizontally. 
um, and uh, this is a uh, this is a plug on either end, and there's a, a an elastic band between them, and so these are pulled out and they're held out by a wire with a loop right here, and so this is triggered by basically releasing these two wire loops and the elastic pull the, pulls these closed at a certain depth. So that's one way of doing it. Um, that's a single depth. Another way that's pretty clever is to use a single stage sampler. And that's shown here. The way this works is here's a bottle and it, we've got a, a tube that's that goes in through a, or through a stopper into the bottle and comes out here and it's positioned at that location. And then there's another tube that comes out and goes to here. Okay, so the bottle's sealed except for these two tubes. So the way that this works is when the water level is right here, there's, there's nothing flowing into this bottle. But when it rises up to here and it passes above this tube, then the water can flow into the tube and water flows out of this tube or air flows out of this tube. Okay, so the water can flow in that causes the air to get pressurized and the, the air flows out. Okay, so so long as the water is above the, the water level uh, of this or the, the, the water is above the entrance level of this tube then that all would work. But if the water goes up above the level of this tube, then the air can't get out. So it stops filling. So if the water is, um, is above here, then, uh, th then you're just really, uh, th this is not active, um, and you've just uh, obtained a sample from, from this depth range. Uh, and what you can do is have these things set up for different depth ranges. So what it allows you to do is get a sample of water from different, when the stream is at different stages. So often what happens is that the amount of suspended sediment, it's going to go up when you have a storm event and the suspended sediment uh, concentration will change throughout the storm event. And this allows you to sample it uh, as the stage is going up and down. Okay, and it's pretty nice, you know, there's no moving parts, it's pretty, pretty robust. There are a couple of other designs uh, of how to do this, but mostly it's kind of set along this kind of siphoning um, procedure with the water level at different depths. Now another approach, though, is to use a pump. It's a non-isokinetic method because the intake of the pump is just at a single location. And you could imagine that you could do this manually. You just would have a little pump that you could activate and pump out a sample. And that certainly is done. But a much cl more clever way of doing this is, um, okay. Yeah, so here's a little bit larger view of this single stage pump or single stage discrete sampler. But the, the, the pumping method, um, uh, uh, a, um, a nice way to implement the pumping is with a programmable auto sampler. And this is made by this company, ISCO. And basically what's going on here is uh, this is a pump, a peristaltic pump. It uh, rotates around and there's some eccentric wheels in here that cause a pumping action. And uh, there's a, a microprocessor in here, a little computer that turns this on at, at, at various times that you program it. And then inside of this chamber, there's a carousel here with these are, each one of these is a little sample bottle. And so this thing will rotate around and uh, at the other, uh, or one end of this sample uh, tube, it, it's positioned above, uh, a po basically above a point in this carousel that will allow you to uh, inject and fill in fill up one of these sample bottles. So the way that it works is um, it fills up these bottles in sequence. And if you have it set up every hour, it would fill up a bottle. And then uh, an hour later, it would rotate and increment over to the next bottle and turn the pump on. And uh, it knows how big the bottles are. So it pumps that much water out and then, uh, and then turns itself off. 
So this kind of thing gives you the ability to sample a stream or, or perhaps other places um, with a time schedule and um, gives you, I mean, it, we talked, I mentioned a, a, a storm pulse. You could use this thing to measure the concentration in the water at a particular point as a function of time. So it doesn't give you the, um, the, the, the stage variation, but it just allows you to do it at every, on, a, on a particular time in interval. So that's quite a nice approach. You can see one here deployed in the field um, by this weir um, set up to get samples on a regular basis. So we've also been interested in the turbidity. Uh, total suspended solids are related to turbidity. Uh, the, the, the two are not equal, but this is a study that looked at the total suspended solids as a function of the turbidity here. And you can see that there's quite a nice linear relationship. Um, and what they found was, though, that this linear relationship was somewhat different depending upon whether you had data in dry weather um, or these plots are for wet weather. Um, and this is the linear relationship between total suspended solids and turbidity. Uh, and this term here is the, the slope. And so on this plot, you can see the, the two different um, regions where the slope is is pretty consistent at these two streams for dry weather, and then the slope gets steeper and a bit more variability um, for wet weather. So there's, there, there is a good linear correlation, but it changes with the weather, and so um, in order to do it reliably, you have to know what the, how, the cor how this correlation term changes with the, with the weather. You have to know what the weather is. Okay, so that's suspended sediment. Then there's also bed load, and this was the picture that we saw at the beginning. Uh, the bed load is the material that's moving along uh, right at the interface between the, the, the sediment and the, the water, and this larger uh, pieces of sediment that are bouncing along. And the way that this is sampled is to use a, a, a device that is a, kind of a box arrangement with a bag here that is a, a filter. So the water can flow in and easily flow out through this bag, this it's a mesh, um, but these larger grains of sediment can't, can't, they're trapped in the bag. So this is put into the flow, you have water flow in here and you trap the sediment and you let it, you put it in position for um, a, a certain time period, you measure the sediment that it traps and that gives you the mass as a function of time along that width of the stream. And you would expect it varies along the width, um, just like the suspended sediment does. And so you would make this measurement at various different positions along the width. And uh, then uh, you have uh, these different representative measurements, and then you add it up to get the total mass as a function of time that's moving down the stream as the bed load. Um, you have the samples here that you've collected, so you can also, uh, actually in both cases, the grain size of the sediment is something that you would be interested in, so you can determine the, the grain size as well as the composition. Here's somebody doing this in, in, in practice in, in a stream that's got a, a good bit more uh, flow and turbulence than the stream